I'm not sure how much introduction is really needed. I feel most people definitely will know uh, Brett and Mark, but as you know, the two of them are our uh, founders. They created all of this and they want to talk a little bit about uh, starting your rental company and giving you the pointers that you need. Thanks, Matt. This is Brett Begley and my business partner, Mark Slater, is on with us. You know, Mark and I have been friends since about age six. So there's a lot of history there, about 40, 42, 52 years, actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we started working together in the uh, late 70s, early 80s in a uh, neighborhood hardware store that did rental. And we took a lot of those ideas and improved them. Um, you've got a sign there on the front, the uh, ABC store, that's um, uh, not really our original store, but we'll say it's our original store. Um, and we grew from there where we opened up a, a second store, a third store, a fourth store, and a fifth store, and then eventually Tent and Table Company. Yep. And Remember there were phone books back then, okay? Big things, all right? A, B, C, first in the phone book, first in the listing, first to get the phone call. Yeah, we went between ABC and AAA hardware and rental, right? <clears throat> Funny story, we started our first uh, rental business on a Sears credit card, if you think about that. So anyways, we'll take you through this and give you some ideas. We hope you get some value out of it. Uh, we, we just want success for everybody. This is part of our give back initiative. So we're going to share with you what we know. And, you know, Mark and I'll talk about it. And we might invite a few of our staff on that are experts in areas that we aren't. <clears throat> you know, the first thing to really think about is why are you in business? Like, why do you want to go into business um, versus work for somebody else? Do you want the stress? Um, do you want the headaches? Um, do you want the financial freedom, right? Do you want the flexibility? So um, do you need the job, right? Do, do you need a job? Because you could actually be buying a job by doing this, buying your own job. Is there something you're really passionate about? Are you passionate about the party rental business? Are you passionate about working on equipment? Um, you know, we had the hardware stores and the rental stores and a great synergy between those two. I'd Definitely, if you're going to do a brick and mortar for the ARA type people or the people that are working for someone that are thinking about being in the hardware and rental business, let me tell you something. There's a, a, a need for a neighborhood hardware store in any town USA, and there always will be. It's like a small neighborhood drugstore that you're going to get personalized service that people uh, that they want and need uh, from this pandemic. My goodness. Uh, uh, it, it's just been unbelievable how people want to, you know, uh, support the businesses within their neighborhood. So for those of you that are thinking in the terms of a, a brick and mortar type store and you're thinking about opening up a business, uh, we can definitely help you out there and talk a lot more about it. Is it a hobby? You know, is this something you're working on equipment? You love working on equipment in your garage. You have a job, uh, as a forklift mechanic and now you want to open up a forklift business or a general repair business or a small engine repair business yard and garden outdoor stuff and you know can you make a living because there's overhead with this right working for someone else versus opening your own business that's a really big change right you've got all those things you probably don't think about like your employer pays for part of your social security. You know, where's your health insurance gonna come from? Where's your retirement fund gonna come from? It just goes on and on and on. And you just wanna budget it out and make sure, you know, is, is this a possible dream of yours that you're passionate about, is it gonna pay your bills? Uh, Mark, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I mean, you know, why are you in business? You know, I, I know a lot of people that I've dealt with over the years have have entered into business because that's where they work, that's what they did, and that's how they grow. And and you know, as it as an employee in the party rental business, you're gonna learn a lot of that knowledge. Um, but you also want to make sure, and we're gonna go over it in the next uh um cell in the next screen, you know what drives you to get into business? Do you have a business plan? Um, and uh, are you are you ready for the challenge? Um, you know, I, you know, that common, 
that common thought of, ah, you're in business, you make your own hours, it's nine to five, you have the weekends off, <clears throat> is, is the farthest from the truth, but it was very rewarding. I was not somebody that liked to work for people, okay? Um, I enjoyed working for people. I learned a lot, okay? But I always had ideas. And Brett, I think you were the same way. We had ideas of how we could do it better, how we can improve on it. And if you have that entrepreneurial spirit, you know, the sky's the limit. Nothing was ever fast enough for me. All of the people I worked for, the companies I worked for, it was like, my goodness, can't we move this along quicker? And I'm talking at 13 years old. That's when I started working in a hardware store. And it just, it, it amazed me. Um, but opportunities for growth, what would the opportunities for growth be for you as you build that business? Um, so you're going to have to do your due diligence, and we'll cover that on the next slide. And I, of course, this isn't going to be a hobby. This is going to be a serious investment. You're going to find that you're going to be leveraging a lot of, lot of um, um, resources you have, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So what is your exit strategy? At the end of the day, when you're ready to retire, what's your exit strategy? Or what is your exit strategy if you borrow money and you do all this stuff and you get hurt and you didn't have disability insurance, um, something happens and you're not able to continue the business. What is the exit strategy? So you have to think about these things as you're, you're moving into um, the idea of, of you know, opening your own business. Um, and like we've got posted here, what is your plan? Take the time to do a business plan. If you don't know how to do a business plan, go to your local um, community colleges or state colleges. I guarantee they have a business development department there and they will help you write a business plan. Not everybody knows how to do it. You don't have to go to college and have a business degree to do this. You just go in there and you ask for help. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff online you can find out about filling in a business plan. Um, we're going to give you a lot of the ideas if you listen to this video. Um, you know, we're going to give you a lot to think about. If you're not in business and you're thinking about opening up business or you're in business and you want to improve your business, you're not happy with your business, I'm hoping this will bring value to you that you'll um, be able to use. Definitely you need a marketing plan. How do you get that? Again, start at a community college. Unless you have a friend, family, or neighbor, you're going to want a marketing plan. How are you going to market this business? And we'll get into that in the next couple of slides, just bootstrap ideas that Mark and I did when we started this business when we were 18 years old, you know? And then of course a strategic plan so that when it's all said and done, we've made um, uh, intelligent decisions that give us a return on investment, protect ourselves, our family and our future, because this isn't a hobby, right? This is, this is an investment in your future. What are your core values, right? You wanna, you wanna talk about that and list them and you wanna run your business that way so that you're hiring people that, that um, follow your core values and your strengths and your weaknesses. And what's your vision? What do you wanna be? Who do you wanna be? And what are you gonna do to get there? So those are the core things, business plan, marketing plan, strategic plan, core values, vision statement. Brett, there's some great free tools online. We can post in an awesome um, Harvard Business Review article about core value and vision statement. And I think we can share that, um, you know, with our Facebook friends too. So do you guys, guys, do you guys know? I found, Kim, uh, oh, sorry. Kim I found uh, awesome COO and chief problem solver. She's been banging away at this with us for 20 years. She's just amazing and does so much to help the company grow and keep us aligned. And we're grateful to have her on our team. Go ahead, Mark. Sorry about that. Um, I was saying too, you know, um, when we opened up our first business, we were very young. Nobody was going to um, give us financial assistance. Okay. We had a Sears credit card. Sears was great because back then they had a warranty on their tools if we bought a rototiller and there was a problem with it and we didn't have a mechanic, we had somebody there that would fix it. 
But as we opened up our second business and we went down, we used the uh, SBA, you know, the SBA, I'll tell you, when you were talking about a business plan and putting together a business plan, you know, they were very helpful and they're very thorough. So, you know, they're, they're, you know, the first true, we didn't, when we opened up our first business plan, I don't, our first business, I don't think we had a true plan because we had been involved in it for so long when we started growing and I did the first business plan for our second hardware store. That was a one inch thick piece of, uh, you know, hundreds of pages of paper that I had to put projections, yearly projections, what I was going to be doing in one year, three years, five years, 10 years, why I was going to be doing it. And it was a great exercise because it made you look forward and, you know, don't ever be afraid of, of going to the SBA and seeing what they have available for you in funding. Their interest rates are favorable. Their payment terms are great. And they'll give you a lot of resources to, to help you along with the uh, whole process. That's a great point, Mark. Um, so uh, if you want to look at the SBA, they have a uh, department called SCORE. And basically, SCORE is a bunch of retired people that are um, out there, business leaders, bankers, entrepreneurs, uh, engineers, you name it, lawyers. And they're, they, they just want to help people. You know, they've been there, they've done it. Um, super, super good idea. Um, thank you. What's next, Kim? Ah, cash is king. Isn't that true? Where are you going to get the money to do this business, right? I mean, uh, did you win the lottery? And maybe that's why you've got a bug that you want to open up a business. You won the lottery and you've got all this money and you're going to invest your money in a business that you're passionate about. That, that's, that's kind of cool. Or you got an inheritance. Here you're not, you know, borrowing money and paying interest, right? Um, what's the go-to that most people do right there? Hold it there for just a minute, Kim. Credit cards. Credit cards. Think about that. Why? Because it's fast and it's easy, right? Let me tell you how fast and easy it is. We ran up 34 credit cards for over 300,000 bucks. That's how we financed our business initially. The bank thought we were crazy paying minimum payments on everything. But you know, that's 1984. It's a little different now. Um, but that's the go-to that people use. They get, you know, the 0% interest for 12 months or 0% interest for six months or, you know, 3.9% interest. So be careful on that. You want to have a backup plan because that can catch up on you real quick. It's, it's nice and easy. It's fast. But um, a little risky, especially uh, nowadays, because uh, I think the credit card companies have got more ruthless than ever in that 21.9% finance charge can <clears throat> get you in trouble right after they, uh, your promotional rate disappears, right? You know, family, that's a serious question, right? People go to their family often, parents, uh, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, Heck, when I started, I borrowed 10 grand from my aunt. She was happy to do it. And in a short period of time, I was able to pay her back, but she didn't want the money back. So, um, but family, family, you know, just, just consider you're borrowing the money from your family. So make sure you're, you're paying it back. Friends, you know, uh, opening up a business and uh, getting money from your friends, uh, you know, again, just make sure you can pay it back. But definitely a resource, especially the rich ones. If you're lucky to have a rich friend that, that uh, wants to help you out, that, that's awesome. The bank. Why does everybody wait for the bank as the last choice? Because it's hard, right? Um, so maybe, maybe that's a good exercise. But for those of you that are just thinking of starting a little business, I'm going to just sidetrack for a minute, just starting a little business to supplement your income, you know, when you have a little bit of money saved or you've got that low interest credit card or you decide you're going to do a lease or something like that. And maybe you're someone that wants to open up an inflatable rental business or a, a little tent business and 
um, someone in your family, maybe, maybe you're married, maybe you're not, maybe you've got kids, maybe you don't, but there's someone there helping you and you've got a full-time job. We have a lot of customers like that and, and you know, it changes their lives. It really changes their lives. So I'm going to just spend a few minutes on this because if you're, you're one of those people that um, maybe you've got a, a partner that's staying at home, taking care of your kids or raising your kids and and you 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 know you want a little something extra. Um, maybe you're an insurance salesman by day and a tent erector by nights, weekends, and holidays. And you know people do this and they add another fifty or sixty thousand. I've heard over a hundred thousand with some people that um, they do this to supplement their their income. They're a car mechanic by day and nights, weekends, holidays. They're grabbing their neighbor and they're going and setting up bounce houses and tents, tables, chairs, and inflatables. There's nothing wrong with that. Many people that do that either, you know, use one of our leasing companies and they'll invest in, you know, 10 or $20,000 worth of inflatables and they'll actually run a little business out of their home. Um, so just make sure on that you have insurance and we'll, we'll talk more about that later. But I just want to make sure that we're we're checking all the boxes because we know we have customers like that and, um, and that's okay. And then we've got customers that, you know, have giant warehouses with 10 trucks and 50 employees and they're, they're doing 150 jobs a week of, uh, you know, party rental, tents, tables, chairs, and deliveries. Um, and they're obviously using a bank and probably the SBA or something like that. But, you know, just starting out to, to use the, credit cards, uh, family, friends. I mean, that's reasonable for 10 or $20,000. It just depends where you are and what you're looking to do. And as long as you have the work ethics and the commitment to do it, you'll do just fine. Let's go to the next slide, Kim. And I just wanted to add, Brett, one thing you taught me was to um, have that relationship with the bank, you know, talk to the community banks, go in, have, you know, not be afraid of them and to develop a relationship. And if they didn't want to do that, it wasn't the right bank. And that is such good advice. I've shared that with so many other business owners. Um, so that's fun. such an excellent point. Well, let's sit on that for a minute. Go back for a second, yeah, because, yeah. because that, that's exactly the case. I mean, um, you know, we've been in business over 40 years, right? So we know a lot of people. We have a lot of relationships. Um, as we grew in our business, I had two banks, right? Because a bank a upset me, I, I went to bank B. And we always had two banks to leverage one against the other to say, look at the interest rate isn't good, the terms aren't good, the line of credit's not good, and, and the relationship's not good. So unless you want to lose me and have me go to another bank, um, you know, like a third bank, now we actually do have three banks. Um, yeah, we, we're going to have a conversation and you're going to explain to me why you're not treating me as I deserve to be treated. And that's exactly what we did with Kim and her business. We walked into the bank and asked them what the hell they're doing, right? And then what happened, Kim? Yeah, I, I got money. <laughs> so, right. yeah, and that's, I mean, that that was a great lesson though. Not only did I get money though, but I developed a relationship. I didn't have a relationship uh, with the bank before. And then we kind of had a dynamic ongoing relationship where I actually would invite them. I would invite them in and want to show them what we were doing, what our strategy was. We created like a war room, um, you know, put all our metrics up on the board and that changed everything. That That's when it all changed for us. Right. And for the better and it grew and grew. Yeah. And grew. yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Mark? No, other than the fact that what we were just talking about is was relationship, okay? Whether it's with your bank, um, your credit card uh, organization by paying on time, your family who is loaning you money and, you know, pay back on the, si the, the right time. One of the best stories I have, and I'll make it quick because I know we'll run out of time eventually, was when we opened up our second hardware store, okay, there is a company called Service Star Hardware. Well, I sat there one day and I did all the ordering for a brand new store that we were opening up. Okay. Um, a week and a half later, three tractor trailers pulled up in front of the store 
and there was more inventory than I could imagine. Worked real hard, got the store set up, everything on the shelves looked beautiful. Here we are ready to go. And Jim Hall, our uh, relationship manager, the regional manager of Service Star comes in and says, Brett and Mark, we have a problem. I said, what's that, Jim? He said, you were supposed to have a $50,000 line of credit. Somehow they gave you a $500,000 line of credit. We have a problem. We said, no, Jim, you have a problem right now because all the stuff is on our shelf. It's marketed. And I said, you can do one of two things here. You can um, send a crew in, okay? They can package everything up, bring it back to the service star warehouse, okay? And you're gonna have open equipment or you can work with us, um, you know, on an unofficial note, we promise to pay you X, Y, Z amount a month for 24 months. And he said, let me take that back to the, uh, the president of the company. And, you know, things were done a little bit more as a handshake back then, but every, they, they said, yes, every month we made our payment. We never missed the payment. We were never late. Okay, and we had basically a half a million dollars worth of instant credit, but more important, we forged a relationship with Service Star that then became True Value. Um, that we were a company of our word, and it you know they gave us it brought us to another level of trust and respect with that company. They never made that mistake again with another uh, vendor. They probably still talk about it today, but that was you know, all a relationship story, okay, with one of our key suppliers. Okay. <clears throat> Where will we conduct our business? What do you think about that? If you're a small um, startup, right? And you're what we were talking about a few minutes ago, and you're that, um, couple that wants to supplement your income to change your lives and increase your your take home pay 30 to $50,000. Maybe you can operate it out of your home. I don't know if your home's zoned for that. Maybe you're rural and <clears throat> maybe you have like a storage barn behind your house. Um, you know, suburban USA in any town USA, I don't know how your neighbors will feel about a bunch of trucks as you grow and expand, uh, pulling in and out of your driveway. But you know, if you're a four bedroom, two and a half garage house, you can stick a lot of tent parts, tables, chairs, and inflatable games in there and start out that way, sure. Um, or are you gonna rent a building? We have a lot of customers that rent the public storage garages, you know, that you store at the $100 a month garages or maybe maybe more than that, or they have two or three garages, and that's where they run their business out of. Or do you rent a, a building on Main Street USA because you're going to do both equipment rental and party rental, um, or you're doing party rental and you want to um, have a family entertainment center uh, as part of that, right? Um, we see a lot of our customers will do that. Um, COVID kind of put the kibosh on that. But prior to that, that was really popular that um, you would have people that would rent uh, a building. They'd have a family entertainment center uh, with their rental equipment. And they would also do the party rental. You know, if they had a party that were, were weather turned into an issue, they would um, suggest to the customer that's getting a tent, tables and chairs, hey, you've got a monsoon coming next week. We have availability if you want to move Susie Lou's uh, birthday party to uh, our event center, you can do that. So these are all things to think about in your business plan, but you know you want a popular, safe place to go, right? You don't want it to be difficult for people to find your business. If you're doing pickup, you don't want them driving to an area that might be known as safe just because you're getting a deal on renting the building and it's a budgetary situation. And, and um, also you wanna make sure it's zoned correctly that you're able to 
um, you know, have trucks and trailers, storage containers, whatever you might possibly need. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Kim or Mark? No, I, I think that about covered it all. I, I do know a lot of people that, you know, they will look at a six by 12 trailer, okay? That six by 12 trailer is their startup inventory. They have everything in that trailer that they need to do to conduct a weekend's worth of business or a week's worth of business, okay? And then as they grow, they buy another trailer. You have, you know, one, you know, you have a driver truck, one person, maybe an assistant, that trailer, and that trailer is that route for the week. It's a great then, idea. Yeah. So you're talking about an enclosed trailer. It's probably a $5,000 investment for a used one, about 10,000 for a new one. And yeah, all your all your party rental stuff's right in that trailer. That's a, that's a good idea. Okay, risk management. So you got to think about this, right? So um, I'm getting into the rental business. I'm going to run this business out of my house in this trailer. You got to have a good solid rental contract. Where do you get that from? Well, if you have a lawyer, he can help you write it up. If you're a member of the American Rental Association, they have some mock-up sample um, contracts. If you're a good customer of Tent and Table or uh, Party Tents Direct or um, Pogo Bounce House, um, they would help you with a contract. So you can uh, talk to them, uh, not helping you in a way that they're gonna write a contract for you, but they would share their contract with you that um, has been used by um, us for almost 40 years. And it's constantly being updated and improved. Contracts are super important. You want in all cases to indemnify and hold yourself harmless um, and let the, because most of the problems in a, an accident or injury happen with the people using them. It's, 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 99% of the time, it isn't a product defect. It's somebody, you know, misusing the item, you know, maybe not parental supervision or things of that nature. Um, so have a good rental contract, especially if you're operating out of your home. And you should also, we're not attorneys, okay? But you really want to uh, probably set up an, uh, uh, a little LLC um, to try to limit the liability if something does go bad and you happen to get sued. Liability insurance starting out. Um, we had Alex Casio on with us the other day. They do an excellent job and they'll open your eyes to some of the things you need to consider. And, uh, you know, you don't want to start in, in any type of rental business um, without some form of insurance. Training, um, where are you getting your training from? Safety training, um, read the owner's manuals. Um, there's safety training courses um, online. Um, you can attend the trade shows, the ARA trade show if you're an ARA member. There's a MATRA show, um, an IFIA show, um, what other safety training? There's independence, uh, Lance Miller, a friend of ours does safety training. It depends on where you're going with your um, with your business. Do you have anything to add to that, Mark or Kim? Um, I was just going to add to when you're talking about um, insurance, and we'll cover this a little further when we talk about who you might be buying from or purchasing from, but liability insurance is a two-way street. You know, buy equipment that is safe, buy equipment that is insurable, buy a equipment and supplies from a supplier who is insured. Um, I see it more and more on the social media posts lately, you know, somebody buying a snow cone machine on Amazon, okay, and these things are $99, okay, as opposed to a four or $500 gold medal one. Well, a gold medal one, you have to use two hands to operate. One's the switch, on and one's the lever, okay? The Amazon ones, turn the switch on, the motor's running, the ice gets jammed, somebody sticks their hand down inside, there's an injury. A cotton candy machine, okay? Amazon's $199 cotton candy machine with exposed wires and sharp pieces of metal. 
Um, so, you know, your, your risk management and liability comes down to the products that you're buying, buy them from known professional companies that have already done the due diligence to make sure that those products are safe for the marketplace. Great points, Mark. And we're not knocking Amazon. Amazon has a lot of good stuff. So does Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, all of those companies. But yeah, the point is, whether you're buying it online or from a professional company, you know, make sure it's a good quality. And we'll get into that um, in the next couple of slides, because like Mark's saying, you don't want to rent something to someone. And the next thing you hear is um, there's blood all over the machine because someone lost a couple fingers in the snow cone machine as the blades ground them away. Um, that happens every year with snowblower injuries. We have people in the hardware and rental stores that, believe it or not, a running snowblower, they take and stick their hand in the chute to unclog the chute. It's crazy. Um, anything I think, you want to add, Kim? Yeah, I think like we've worked with a lot of companies, helping companies start out and helping them grow. And <clears throat> I find the companies who have safety in their core values or in their mission or their vision where um, the company is making it a core foundational core and then they're spreading it to the employees and then making sure that their suppliers are also concerned about safety like everybody's on board they have the best you know success at keeping the, their staff safe and their customers safe so something to consider is like how will you work that into your mission your vision or your values you know, your safety and then make sure that your vendors, your suppliers share that same, you know, message and passion for safety as you do. We find people who, customers and I'm um, sorry, businesses who do that are just, they're having, you know, the most success at it. It definitely needs to be part of your culture. Yeah. For sure. 